Hello, everyone. Uh, this is John Bale speaking, and I would like to welcome you all to this online webinar offered by Thought Technology on harnessing slow cortical potentials with the SCP suite. In case you are not familiar with me, I am the application specialist at Thought Technology, and I'm one of the individuals who gives these online webinars to help inform people and also let them know what Thought Technology is up to. Um, today's session, as the title suggests, will focus on the use of slow cortical potentials and how you can potentially integrate that into your clinical toolbox with your clients. There's a lot of talk about slow cortical potentials where people love to hear about it, but they often get a little bit confused. And I'm just here to clear some of that up because it really is an excellent method that's scientifically driven and straightforward and with very little sort of questions to ask in terms of how do you interpret data or what do you do with training. It's all really kind of set up for you and that's what makes it really, really cool. When we think of slow cortical potentials, we think of a new way of measuring brain activity. For those of you who are already familiar with what I'm gonna call traditional neurofeedback, um, you notice there's a lot of sort of splitting apart of signals and uh, trying to interpret that sort of information. Slow cortical potentials actually um, simplifies a lot of that because instead of trying to split apart an electrical signal, we're looking at a single signal and just how that electrical activity changes. Even um, the parts of the brain that we're measuring in terms of activity are slightly different. Um, for traditional neurofeedback, you place the electrode on quite a few different locations, depending on what the condition is. But for slow cortical potentials, we're not so much interested in these different locations in relation to uh, sort of the pyramid neurons that are firing. We're actually looking at a different set of neurons, so the glial neurons that are, you can think of them more as the conductors of a symphony. If the pyramid neurons are the symphony, the glial neurons are the ones that are being the conductors that let the other neurons know when they're supposed to be active or not. So we're even looking at a different dynamic of the brain with this type of measurement. Um, one of the big things with slow cortical potentials is how scientifically validated this is, because there's been some really good published work that shows exactly how to train with slow cortical potentials on individuals and have show very clear, clear outcomes that are extremely beneficial. The biggest paper is probably based on Dr. Udi Strail's uh, research uh, on children with ADHD. And she published in the pediatrics paper, which is a huge, huge thing to get, especially if you're doing some type of neurofeedback. Um, what she did is she actually showed a perfectly valid method that had little to no question that this could potentially be some sort of placebo or, or interaction where the client benefits just with being there with a therapist. Um, as a staunch researcher who created an amazing clinical method, what she actually did was had people do neurofeedback training where there was zero human interaction. And so the benefit is clearly just from the client interacting with the computer, and they're not even given instructions beforehand what to do. They just see feedback on the screen, and it eventually clicks in. What's amazing about her original research with these ADHD kids, as well as other research related to um, epilepsy, seizures, migraines, is that we looked over that research and we actually created a clinical method in terms of a software suite where you can do exactly what she did and get the exact same benefits for your clients in terms of ADHD, epilepsy, and migraines. It's really, really cool how she structured it and it was just so well explained and so well thought out that it's, it's made quite, quite the difference, and it really was impressive. Now, before I go ahead and move forward to looking at some of the software, we'll just take a little bit of a step back to see how slow cortical potentials is different from sort of that traditional neurofeedback. I realize people definitely are going to have questions about that. Um, one thing to start off when we consider traditional neurofeedback and slow cortical, slow cortical potential neurofeedback is exactly the signal that we're looking at. Obviously, it's brainwave information but the way we measure it is differently. Here on the left-hand side is just the raw EEG signal we typically see during a traditional neurofeedback session. Notice how the electrical signal sort of goes up to a bit of a positive number, goes down to a bit of a negative number, a bit of a negative number and always returns back to zero. That's just the measurement of the different neurons firing at different speeds. Um, notice the slow cortical potentials, though, on the upper right. This electrical signal is never really returning to zero. In fact, it's just... Um, a general charge and it's slowly drifting or shifting to being a little bit more positive or a little more negative. And so there's already quite the difference there. How we're collecting this electrical signal, for those of you who are a little bit of nerds and like a little bit of physics, is that for traditional neurofeedback, it's um, alternating current. And for slow current potentials, it's actually direct current. So really it's at that 
electrical level where things are changing. Um, the next big difference between the two is that for traditional neurofeedback, we're actually breaking apart that raw EEG signal. And so we're breaking it apart into the different frequencies or bandwidth frequencies, we call them. You know these as delta, theta, alpha, beta, et cetera. And we focus in on a certain uh, aspect of that electrical signal that we start doing training. For slow cortical potentials, we actually don't break apart the electricity at all. We want to see it all at the same time. It's really just this single signal, and we're looking for shifts in that electrical signal. So it's simplified in that aspect. If we think back to traditional neurofeedback, we can look at that electrical signal in these different frequencies as amplitudes or ratios, sometimes alpha peak frequency or even standard deviations if you think of uh, normative training or z-scores. And then once we choose that type of statistic, we have to decide if we're going to increase or decrease, and often we do this for several different frequencies at a time. SCP neurofeedback doesn't do any of that. You're either activating to increase, uh, activating or deactivating in terms of training to make the signal go uh, more negative or more positive. So again, that electrical shifts. Um, SCPs is incredibly simpler <laughs> for what the client has to do and for how you're looking at the signal, and that's what makes it really, really, really cool. As a last thing, for traditional neurofeedback, it's continuous training. And so essentially, you have your client who might be sitting there for five minutes or maybe 20 minutes, and they're getting that constant feedback. Feedback might be turning on and off or, how, or louder or softer sounds or things like that. But it's continuous training, and we're seeing the spontaneous changes in brain activity in relation to them trying to uh, do the training task. Slow cortical potentials is quite different from that. It's actually cued training. So slow cortical potentials themselves, it's very much an, a triggered event. And so there's a, a cue where the client knows they have to either activate or deactivate, and then we see how the brain responds to it over a very short period of time. It's about 0.3 seconds to 8 seconds. And we see how the brain can either activate or deactivate, and then they get a, a brief break, and then we repeat that cue and see how the brain reacts. Like I said initially, um, for slow carb potentials, we're looking at these conductor neurons, so how they tell the rest of the brain to activate. So they only really care about immediate sort of cued stimuli or something like that as opposed to this traditional neural feedback where it's continuous and waiting to see the changes up and down. So knowing a little bit about slow cortical potentials and how it differs from traditional neural feedback, what is this slow cortical potential package that you can potentially use? Well, the slow cortical potential suite that Thought Technology currently offers is essentially just a three-phase training program. Like I said, we're doing the work for you. So you just get the training program, you immediately know how to work with the client. The idea is that uh, it comes with three different protocols, and each one is designed for a different phase of training. As you might imagine, phase one is easier, phase two is a little bit harder, and phase three is more advanced. And we'll look at that in a little bit. The SCP suite also comes with three types of Excel reports, and they naturally mirror each protocol. So one Excel for each type of protocol, so essentially one Excel for each type of phase. And these Excels show the results of a training session uh, quite easily in a way that you can digest and keep track of and the client can get a better understanding how well they did. Now, what is exactly the slow cortical potential training program that you can do with this software? Well, I mentioned there's three phases of training. And so there's an easier phase, phase one, a little bit uh, more moderate, phase two, and then a little advanced phase three. This actually follows exactly Dr. Udi Strail's training protocol that she used to have her published work uh, get into the pediatric magazine when doing um, ADHD training with children. So phase one is essentially just 10 training sessions within 10 days. Phase two is another 10 sessions within 10 days, and phase three is, again, 10 sessions within 10 days. But between these intense training periods, it's a four to six week break. So the idea is that a client comes in, they might see you for 10 sessions in 10 days, and then you do not see them for uh, a month and a half to two months. And Dr. Strail said that this is a good period of time where the brain is able to uh, react to the changes and change its functioning before the individual comes back in to do more training. Um, now, I didn't really say very much what occurs in these phases, how they're slightly difficult, how they're slightly more harder than the other. And so as phase one is considered, it's a, a simple starting point where the individual is just learning to understand how to do slow cortical potential training and how they build up this uh, association of feeling of activating or deactivating. The phase one itself also includes a small little period of time where they do transfer trials, 
which is just a fancy name for the individual is told to activate and deactivate by the computer, but they're not given any immediate feedback of how well they're doing it as they're doing it. So really, it's, it's just a check to, for them to try to internalize that feeling because we all know in the reality, they're not going to be having someone giving them constant feedback of whether they're more or less active. Phase two adds in a new level of difficulty by increasing the number of transfer trials. So instead of just one little sort of taste of it in phase one, they instead have to do transfer trials four times during each training session. And so they're practicing more without the continuous feedback, and the computer only tells them how well they did at the end. Phase three, which is the more advanced, is similar to phase two. So we have more transfer trials when they're practicing without getting feedback. But it now starts to bias whether we want them activating or deactivating more. This makes sense because in the very beginning, she wants them practicing both just to get a feeling of what activating and deactivating is. But then based on the clinical condition, they're going to focus on one or the other. For the ADHD kids, they were actually practicing to activate more because the idea or the concept was that um, their, their wavering attention is not letting them focus very much. So they need to activate their brain so that the conductors can activate the other parts of the uh, brain a little bit better. However, for example, epileptics, she would have them eventually bias and focus more on deactivating. The brain had too much activity initially, and so she wanted to teach it to deactivate. So that's how the bias might go based on the condition. What is an actual individual training session like within any of these phases? Well, it's really just four different periods. Essentially, they do uh, four segments of continuous training or four runs, and then they get a break in between each one. And within those runs, it's four trials, so 40 attempts at doing uh, activating or deactivating. Like I said initially, slow cortical potentials is not meant to be continuous training. It's meant to be uh, cued or event triggered. So there's the trigger of activate, they try for a moment, and then they stop. And then the trigger for deactivate, and they try for a moment, and they stop. And each of those would be considered one trial each. Our total duration for these four runs altogether would be 35 minutes. And so it's essentially... Uh, trial training for nine minutes each. Now, this whole like single training session lasts 35 minutes. So if you're going to do neurofeedback with someone, it fits very well into that whole 50 to 55 minute session. You sit them down and they're practicing this task and then they're, they can leave the office. Um, as a last little detail, the actual base training unit within any of these trials is that they get to take a five second break where they're sitting there just relaxed they get a cue whether they want to activate or deactivate, and then they have to attempt to do that activating or deactivating for eight seconds. Don't worry, we're gonna have a look at the software in a second, you'll see exactly what that looks like. They then repeat this five second break, eight seconds worth of work in the trial, 40 times, and then that's one run, and as we saw on the previous slide, they get a break and then they have to do three more runs, and then that would be at the end of their training session with you over that 35, 36 minute period. Um, the choice of activating or deactivating alternates. So in the very beginning, they're just getting an idea of what it feels like to activate, then deactivate. And only after phase two, so going to phase three, do we then bias and have them deactivate more or activate more, depending on the clinical condition. One cool thing that we have uh, in terms of uh, equipment, well, there's a few cool things, but one that you guys need to be aware of is that we actually co-opt an EEG sensor a EGZ sensor, not to really measure brainwave activity, but to be used for eye movement artifacts. Dr. Strail's original research had some special electrodes placed around the individual's eye where it would be able to tell when the individual moved their eyes or generate an artifact. And that would essentially kind of cancel one of the training uh, trials, one of those short eight-second attempts at activating or deactivating. And so we've also copied that because we want to be exactly like our research because we want everyone to be able to get the same results. And so this is something that uh, we're going to see a quick example of because I have it actually on my face right now. Um, all right. That was an introduction to the concept of a training uh, protocol or a training session with the suite. So let's actually have a look at the software and see how this looks because I find that much, much more interesting, much more, more relevant to you guys. As always, if you guys have any questions as we're going along, please let me know. I'm happy to ask them. Slow cardiac potentials, again, people get a little bit daunted, but they shouldn't be because it's, it's so well formatted that it makes it easy. So I've just opened up the Biograph program, and I'm going to hit the Quick Start button. And we can see on the left-hand side, I have many, many clients whose names I have mostly hidden, but I'm going to choose my name, John Bale. On the right-hand side, I have the SCP suite selected, and we have the exact choice of sessions that are available. 
Now, notice how the majority of these say phase one, phase two, or phase three. Like I said, the choice of protocol depends on what phase of training you're in. We start with phase one, because we're going to pretend that I'm a new person. But if you are have already done a bunch of training through phase one, you, start, you go to phase two. And if you're advanced, you go to phase three, where you start biasing in a certain direction. Notice that we also have choices where whether you want to do a one monitor with training or two monitors. Um, with two monitors, the, you have a second monitor that the client looks at, and so it's easier for them to focus less uh, other instruments available that are actually focused on a, the first monitor for you, the clinician. We're going to be looking at the one monitor version today just because I have two computer setups and an online presentation like this is just, just doesn't work very well. So I'm going to choose phase one, monitor one. We're not going to run a whole training session with this, or at least we're not going to look too much into the data simply because me talking and slow core potentials do not work well together. So we're going to briefly open this live, but otherwise I'm going to jump to a replay as I talk more about the information. All right. So phase one of SCP training. Now, here's a quick reminder of exactly how this protocol and the session would work. So we have a quick little artifact calibration where we get to check to make sure that the uh, electrodes on my face for those eye artifacts are detecting the data correctly. And then otherwise we start uh, our first run. And then after the first run, we go to second and then third and fourth run. As I told you, a single run is just 40 trials, so 40 eight-second work periods with those little five-second breaks in between. And we do have a small little transfer trial period in the third run, so where they get zero feedback and they're just told to try to activate and you let them know how well they did or try to deactivate and let them know how well they did at the end. I'm just going to key to continue. Now, this is quick artifact calibration. So what we do right here is with those electrodes on my face, um, we're just going to have me, the pretend client, blink their eyes a few times, and we want to make sure that this little red light turns on whenever any of these eye blinks is, is, are detected. And so this verifies if the person ever generates an artifact that the system is going to not give them any reward. A reason why this is really important is that slow, to cor slow cortical potentials, it's a full range of, of frequencies. So like I said, we're looking at the whole electrical signal. And so it's not like with traditional neural feedback where we tend to be you know, above two hertz. Um, we actually look very, very close to zero hertz, so those lower frequencies, all the way up to, um, I believe it's 35 or 40 hertz, well, the standard neural feedback range that are of use. And so it's really important that we are able to uh, tell when they're generating artifacts, because otherwise they might get some fake rewards. So this is all correct right now. At this stage, I'd hit a key to continue, and then our training would initially start. Now, don't worry, we're going to come back to this. But because I'm talking, we can't do active training, so I'll just replay a session. Don't worry, the session is still of me, so it's probably very entertaining seeing how I did with slow corridor potentials. All right, so I'm going to replay this session. Now, it's essentially saved data, but it'll be much easier for me talking and for you guys being able to listen and follow through. So, as you can probably notice right now, there's two sections to this window. There's the left-hand side which is uh, a little bit sort of greenish. This is meant for you, the clinician. And then there's the right-hand side in white with some little bonum, little, little men uh, who are meant for feedback. The idea is that client focuses on the right-hand side and you, the clinician, can focus on the left, but also glance at the right. Now, you're undoubtedly hearing some tones, or at least if the tones are loud enough, you're hearing them through my microphone. These tones are actually part of the cues for this slow cortical potential training. Like I said, this training is based on uh, event-triggered stim or, or stim and you're cueing the individual to try to activate and deactivate. What the tones do is that if it's a higher tone, it means activate, just like there, where you want to make this individual fly up by activating. And then there's a second high tone to signal the end of your attempt. If you do well, there you go, we get a little bit of a reward. And then the tone for deactivating, the lower tone will sound, and this individual ideally is going to try to swim down, so if you're deactivating uh, the brain activity. This is the very simple deactivating, activating alternative training where individuals are being cued to practice. Notice there's this little man right here that has the up arrow for uh, activate, and he's going to have a blue arrow for deactivate. It's very simple, very straightforward. Now, in Dr. Uh, Strail's original research, this was exactly how they did the training. There was no clinician in the room. There's no clinician that ever told the client what to do. 
they were just hooked up with the electrodes and they're able to see this computer screen that was having up, down, uh, up arrows and down arrows cueing them whether they want to activate their brain or deactivate their brain. One thing they also learned is that there'd be um, an indicator if the person was moving their eyes too much, so generating fake signals that would ruin one of these little training periods. Whenever um, they generate too much eye movements, it would just cancel any type of feedback they potentially got. Now, this is quite simple. Like, it's the same type of activity. It's alternating between activating in red and deactivating in blue. And they just hear a nice sound that cues them when to activate and cues them when to deactivate. They also have that reward, the little sort of dancing man who does a dance if you did a good job of deactivating or activating. Like right there, the individual swam down, so he was deactivating correctly and did well. Some of you might have some questions of what are we activating or deactivating in relation to? It's in relation to uh, a moment before you're given that cue. Wherever your electrical um, values are at for that moment, we want to see you deactivate compared to that initial baseline just a moment ago. Or we want to see you activate compared to that baseline just a moment ago. And so it's very much a relative measurement. This initial phase one training is just someone learning what it feels like to activate and deactivate willingly um, according to a cue. And this is exactly what the software is showing us right now. It rewards us when we correctly deactivate. Oh. Like, there you go, he's going to do it quite well. There's the reward. And then if there's no reward, then the simple man does not dance. And so right now, oh, are they going to activate correctly? Maybe. One of the things I learned when I actually did this session on myself is that um, I was doing the exact opposite of what the cues asked for. When the software had asked me to activate, I would deactivate. When the software act asked me to deactivate, I would activate. And so... Um, when I spoke with Dr. Strail, actually, she said that was the exact same feeling everyone gets. They, they typically do the opposite of the correct activity, and even in the research it showed how they initially were doing the opposite of what they should have, but it takes a few sessions to really get that going. Um, I was very lucky at the most recent AAPB conference in Chicago. I got a chance to speak with Dr. Strail and show her the software, and she really, really liked it. Um, her original research was done with a, a private piece of equipment that's is not easily accessible. And so um, she liked seeing how other people are um, taking her method and making it available on other platforms. Someone has a quick question about the, the 10 sessions in 10 days uh, that ran with the individuals. Someone's saying, like, did they do 10 sessions such that it also included weekends? Um, in her original study, she didn't really indicate any difference between weekdays or weekends. So I suspect, yes, it was just 10 continuous days. That being said, you can probably maybe extend the period of time for those 10 sessions to be two weeks. So it'd be like two weekdays instead of weekends or something like that. There is room for you to make these clinical choices. It's just we're letting you know exactly how the research did it and how it can be structured. You'll notice here that my percent of success in this run is quite low. It's about 43%. That's incredibly normal. <laughs> People don't know what this feels like when they start doing slow corrigo potentials. And so uh, the success rate is typically quite low, as Dr. Strail told me. And so it's, 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 it's normal. That's how it works. Um, I'm going to actually stop this session right now because it's, it's very simple feedback. This is what the image looks like for this training phase. Let's have a look at actually what the report looks like when they're done doing this full um, training protocol. Okay. Someone had a funny comment about um, <laughs> Germans not working weekends, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to take the same session we we're just replaying, and I'm going to choose to review it. Now, a lot of you do not particularly want to review training data because it seems like it might be too much information, and that's okay. We've modified the Excel to be as easy going in order to understand information. Right now, we're looking at a few different visual displays. It's not the Excel report yet, but if you were interested in this, you can see the overall trends of how my brain was activating or deactivating on subsequent training trials. Notice how these red and blue lines represent the difference deactivating and activating, and notice how they start shifting quite differently. So there was a part of me in this first learning stage where I was starting to get the idea of how to deactivate or activate my brain.
I'm just going to generate the Excel report. So I'm going to go to this little printer icon and choose Generate Excel. And Microsoft Excel will take just a moment to open up on my computer, but here it is. So let me zoom in a little bit, make this easier for you to read. All right, so phase one, because this is very beginning training. Um, we have client information, naturally the name, time, and date. And then we have information on how feedback went. And so whatever there was a positive success uh, for um, activating or deactivating. Notice also that there's a small, well, a graph here that matters a little bit less, but for, shows for transfer trials, how well I was, I did for those brief period of transfer trials where I get no feedback, so no man that's trying to fly or man trying to swim away, and it just lets me know how well I did at the end. Also notice the failure rate. So failure rate means the number of times I <laughs> had eye movement screw up um, one of my training sessions. Uh, that's 41%. So it's, it's hard to keep the eye still, but that's why we have these special electrodes on the face to let us know when the person is uh, moving their eyes too much and thereby ruining one of the little sort of training trials or training attempts. Further below here, we actually have the full-on numbers of the number of times during the runs where we had positive success, so uh, for trying to activate or deactivate uh, the brain. And we can compare over each run of the single protocol how well I did. There's even a bit of a description to help understand what this means because <clears throat> your client will initially not really understand the significance, and so that's why we include some words to help you with that. And so it makes it much, much easier. Naturally, everyone loves some pie graphs, and so we can see in these pie graphs how, how well I did. Um, <laughs> positive feedback. Uh, see how my failure count is 45%. <laughs> Success count was only maybe one-third of the times, and so I had a really hard time um, doing those feedback trials well. Same thing when I was trying to... Uh, uh, deactivate or make my little guy fly, success count was only 4 to 4%, so it wasn't much better than before. <laughs> okay, so this is an example of just one of the reports for phase one. The phase two and phase three reports would be slightly different in relation to um, that increased difficulty where there's more transfer trials in phase two, and then phase three where we're actually favoring uh, the activating the brain or deactivating the brain based on the clinical condition or the reason the person's there. There's an interesting thing to actually take from her original research, and she confirmed this to me when I had a discussion with her two weeks ago. Um, we like to imagine that because the individual is practicing to activate the brain and deactiv deactivate the brain back and forth, that the individual would get really good at doing both. That's not actually true. The results of her paper were very, very clear where the ADHD children they learned how to activate their brain more, but they were terrible at deactivating it more. Again, the idea was that the brain was already so deactivated that perhaps it could not go any further in that direction, and that's why they never had much success attempting to deactivate their brain during those individual training trials. Only they actually learned how to activate the brain, and that really showed in the research. So that's super, super interesting. In relation to the epileptics, they learned how to deactivate their brain, but they weren't able to activate it anymore because conceptually uh, their brain was already too active and that was part of the problem. Now, I do not have um, phase two or phase three recorded, but they visually look exactly the same. And so I don't feel a need to show you guys that because it's the same type of feedback. You have the red flying man with a cape going up, and the blue swimmer going down and them getting feedback as they go along, with the exception of during transfer trials when those men essentially uh, are not there and all they have to do is activate or deactivate on cue and they're told if they do it well at the end of it. One question you might have is what occurs during these four to six week breaks? I mean, are they just sitting around and uh, they're not told to do anything? Can they just get to you know, relax and wait for phase two or phase three to start and time to pass? Uh, that's not actually true. Um, in between phase one and phase two, as well as phase three and phase four, uh, they were given flashcards for home training. And so the idea is that uh, they're asked once per day to have a look at these flashcards and try to remember how to activate or deactivate. They made sure the flashcards included the same type of visual feedback that the individual was training on on the computer screen. And so um, they'd look at the flashcard, 
for the the red caped man to activate. And they got to see the blue swimmer man to deactivate. And they're also given that sense of reward with the, the sort of the dancing, well, the dancing individual. Um, the actual feedback she used was not specifically a flying man and a swimming man or the, 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 dancing, the dancing sort of juggler. But this is the imagery that we're using that people react really well to because it, it feels like a, it makes sense. Now, if you guys have any questions about this software, please go ahead and throw it at me. Otherwise, I'm just going to mention exactly how we do uh, this recording in terms of equipment, because that's something I haven't mentioned. So I already said, actually, the one thing I did mention is that we do have this EEGZ sensor that we co-opt to measure uh, eye movement. And so the electrodes get put on the forehead, the change of the eye, and also uh, one behind the ear. In terms of actual recording activity for the brain waves, though, it's a completely different sensor. And so it's called an EEGZ3 sensor. The reason we need a new special sensor is because we're measuring quite a wide spectrum of electroactivity. Like I said, we're going into uh, the low hertz ranges, much lower than two. And so for slow cortical potentials, we need to be able to get a clean signal of near zero hertz and all the way up to the standard 35, 40 hertz of uh, traditional brain waves. Um, this specialized equipment obviously needs a little bit of tinkering inside the box, but it also includes uh, specialized electrodes. Uh, the standard uh, gold electrodes that people use for traditional neural feedback or Z-scores is not appropriate. Um, we have to instead use silver-silver or silver-centered silver chloride uh, electrodes in order to help avoid impedance issues and things like that. Because we're going to such low frequencies in terms of this whole electrical signal, um, it needs a slightly different alloy to avoid those impedance check problems. Something else that we need in terms of the equipment is uh, a TT AV sync timing device. Slow cortical potentials are uh, events based on acute stimuli. And so you react to that stimuli of having the, the tone and the arrow say activate or deactivate. This timing device uh, lets us know exactly up to, I believe it's five milliseconds accuracy, or actually you can go lower on other types of equipment. It's up to five milliseconds accuracy, and that's what we need to measure the slow cortical potential. So growth potential itself only starts at uh, 0.3 seconds after the stim is presented. And so this timing mechanism is really, really important for the clean, uh, accurate measurement of the electrical response. In terms of physical encoders, I mean, you can use a Procom 5 or Procom Infinity box because these have advanced uh, higher sampling rates than some of our smaller units. Um, plugged, into these sensor, plugged into these boxes, we are using at least three sensors, as I pointed out just earlier. And so... Um, for those of you who have a Procom 2 little white box, it's just not appropriate because you can only take two sensors at a time. And again, just the sampling rate is not fast enough for what we need. In terms of software, well, as you might imagine, for the Slow Cortical Potentials program, you would need the Slow Cortical Potentials suite. Um, that itself works within the Biograph Infinity program. So for those of you who might not know, Biograph Infinity is the backbone multimedia program. And so the SCP suite just runs in that Biograph Infinity program. Um, in terms of cost, people like to ask this question. The Slow Cortical Potential Suite itself goes for retail price of 295 US. Um, this month, though, we all do have a special, so you get 10% off the purchase of the SCP Suite in case that's something you're interested in. For those of you who do have to buy additional hardware for this, um, the extra sensors, so the EEGZ, the EEGZ3, the one that actually measures the Slow Cortical Potential Signal, and that timing AV Sync device along with the SCP Suite, goes for uh, 1770 in terms of US dollars. And then if you don't have any of our encoder equipment at all, some of the packages are as low as $4,920 retail, just to understand that. Someone's asking, in what sort of conditions is slow cortical potentials more efficient uh, than classical neural feedback? It's just a different paradigm of looking at how you do training and, and simplicity in it. Slow cortical potentials has a very strong paperwork, and like extremely strong published material, shows it's very useful for people with uh, seizures, epileptics, as well as ADHD in children or adults, and migraines. Migraines is a bit similar to um, epileptics in the sense that there's too much electroactivity and the person is eventually learning to deactivate. There's also a lot of research going on currently in the U.S. in relation to depression, uh, schizophrenia, depression, things like that. It's still ongoing, um, but Currently, the best use for this, as shown in research, is that ADHD, uh, seizures, and migraines. 
Um, in terms of learning options, I mean, we have a lot of ways you can learn about slow curve potentials in general or learn about how to technically use it on a computer software. I mean, Thought Technology already offers a bunch of online and on-site training. I'm one of the individuals who would give this training over four to six hours on slow cortical potentials and using on someone. So that's definitely an option. Um, for those of you who probably already know us, you know that we go to a lot of workshops um, in different countries. And so if you see we're going to be um, at that particular workshop or that particular event, uh, let us know because we'd always be happy to show you a bit of slow cortical potentials there. Or you can always ask us to give um, a talk on slow cortical potentials to show you how that works in person. Another good option is some recorded events. I know there's resources online, such as AAPB or BCIA, that uh, have webinars on slow cork potentials. The Biofeedback Federation of Europe, the BFE, where I used to work, also has a lot of good stuff on slow cork potentials. In particular, and I'm biased because I helped the Rangers course, uh, there's a six hour recording on uh, slow cork potentials. It was taught by Linda Walker. She is a phenomenal instructor and she goes over a lot, a lot of clinical detail that I could not possibly cover in this simple one hour session. So for any of you who want to learn more about soccer potentials in the theory, I definitely suggest going over to the BFE, so bfe.org, and checking out that recording. Okay, I know some people are asking about the effectiveness of slow cortical potentials for peak performance and stress management. Um, I do not currently know about research that shows stress management and peak performance uh, can can be enhanced or, or, or lessened uh, with slow cortical potentials. That being said, I've not actually gone looking for those particular subjects just because um, they're not the, the, the high-level research that we're really aiming for. And so it's possible, but I haven't actually had a check, so I'm sorry that I can't give you a good answer on that. Okay. Um, a quick question about the retailing prices. If you were wondering, uh, these are the price, retail prices for Canada and the U.S., just to make that clear. Um, the prices might be different in other countries because there's always import fees and things like that. And so this is just as they are um, for Canadians and Americans. All right. So if we have any more questions, uh, or if we do not have any more questions, then this might be the end of the presentation, so I'll give you all one last opportunity to write those in if you want. Just so you know, here are two really, really good references in relation to slow cortical potentials um, and ADHD in particular. Um, Dr. Udi Strail is the writer of these two papers. She's really good at explaining it in, in published format, and I know a lot of writers, especially scientific writers, are quite poor at that, but I was impressed by how well she does it. Other good uh, researchers also from uh, Germany, would be Niels Bierbomber. Uh, he did a lot of good work, and I think his was more of the early on epileptics, but he had some really good papers as well. All right, so if there any is no more questions, we might just end the session here. Ah, there we go, right on cue. We have someone else sending something in. Someone's asking, what do you need if you're already equipped for classical neurofeedback? So that's a really good question, and um, I'm glad you asked it because maybe I didn't make it very clear. Ideal for someone who always has classic neurofeedback, so typical equipment. What you would need would be this TTAV Sync box and the EEG Z3. Since you already have um, sensors for normal neurofeedback, you would most likely already own this EEG Z sensor in the middle. And so you need the two piece of equipment on the side and obviously the slow cortical potential suite. If I actually were to jump back a few more steps in the slide, I'll make this a little bit easier in seeing which sensors you need. You would need uh, this EEG Z3 sensor for measuring the slow cortical potential signal. Um, and you would also need the TTAV sync, so that timing accuracy that we need in terms of uh, the stim event for the slow cortical potential uh, activation. Um, Potentially, actually, one thing you might also need is that you already have the EEG Z sensor, but you might actually need just a little extender electrode cable that goes into the head of the uh, EEG Z sensor, as well as those disposable electrode pads that we use to actually attach the sensors onto the individual's uh, face.
if you already have the EEG sensor, EEG Z sensor, you don't have to buy the whole package. We can just give you the remaining uh, piece of equipment you do not currently have. So that's totally no problem. There's some individuals asking about that, and I can just contact you uh, separately. Um, if someone's asking if it's cheaper to buy the package, I, I think for, for those mix and match pieces, we'll just show you what the costs are in difference, and so you'll be able to decide on your own. It makes it easier like that. Uh, someone is asking, um, where are we using the electrodes on the brain? Great question. It's actually at CZ. It's just CZ where we're placing the um, electrode that's linked directly to this EEG Z3. And so that's where all that work was done for uh, ADHD um, seizures as well as migraines. Now, think about it that the neurons we're, we're trying to measure, they're the conductors. And so... Um, it's general sort of cell assemblies are deactivating and then that electrical signal goes off to other parts of the brain. So we're measuring that uh, those, those conductors at a certain location, but their effect is very much wide spanning across uh, the cerebrum. All right, I do not see any more questions. So how about if any of you have any more questions at a later time uh, and forget about them and I mean, do not think of them right now, you can always email me at johnbale at thoughttechnology.com and I'll be happy to get you guys an answer. All right, so if that's all it, thank you very much, everyone, for attending this session. I realize slow cortical potentials uh, can seem a little bit difficult, but it's just, it's really not. <laughs> it, if it's a very formal format for training. It makes a very clear result, and we've seen it in terms of amazing research where there weren't even a therapist present, and so with an added therapist there, it might even be better. And just, I think it's a, a clear and uh, great tool someone can use on these certain client populations. All right, so thank you very much, everyone, uh, again, and we will see you at the next presentation, or we'll see you at the next time we're in person at a show. All right, thank you very much. Bye-bye.